Stanford University. Well, thanks everyone for coming. It's a pretty good turnout. Thanks for thanks to Steve Eglash for uh, inviting me out and to uh, to leave for helping set up what was already a very productive day. It's great to meet some of the folks here at Stanford, some of the thought leaders in this area and in the areas of economics and finance. We specialize in costs and spreadsheets, as I was introduced as a spreadsheet jockey. So we look at the cost of making these, uh, these devices. And from time to time, we actually step back and look at our results and ask if they describe what is going on in the industry. And do these make sense? And of course, one of the significant trends going on in the PV industry, other than the costs falling, is that uh, manufacturing market share seems to be shifting to certain locations. And we want to understand what is driving this and motivating it. And that's a very multidisciplinary question to ask. And so it's great to have this opportunity to interact with, uh, with so many folks. I am not tied to a single technology, nor do I advocate one. And um, this is very important, actually, especially for this analysis. We're going to mention a few company names as we talk through some of these issues. And I want everyone to understand that our cost analysis is a general one. It's, uh, it's meant to generalize what's occurring. We do not have any special insights into any particular technology. These are not SunTex costs. These are not Solar World's costs. These are uh, simply our analysis of costs based on publicly available information, some, uh, as well as some other data sources, but in aggregate form uh, from them. All right. So. Our presentation is intended for a wide audience, so I'll just start by talking a bit about the uh, solar supply chain. So when we talk about solar manufacturing, which is the topic here today, and US competitiveness in particular, what are we talking about manufacturing? And actually, for silicon PV, we're actually very good at certain parts. So for polysilicon, we have cheap hydroelectricity here in the US. And we tend to be a major exporter of polysilicon feedstock. For ingots and for wafers, it tends to be one of these, uh, it's a dirtier business, uh, labor intensive. It's hard to teach robots how to handle thin wafers and separate them from one another when they're wet. There's certain aspects that lend themselves to low cost labor regions. The heart of this supply chain, I would submit, is the cell and the module, the solar panel here. Um, that's really what drives the industry. The solar cell is where the technologies differentiate themselves largely. It's how, they, it's how uh, sun power achieves its high efficiency. The solar module is uh, also a critical step that we will talk about in more detail. We think will eventually uh, be regionalized. And then supporting all of these steps is a, a lot of equipment, raw materials, as well as uh, other intermediate products that go into the manufacturer. And we, uh, I, am a big believer that the R&D, the supply chain, will follow the manufacturing. So we may do a lot of R&D here in uh, PV today, but in order to sustain that, we're really going to have to manufacture products here. I think you can see that with uh, simple examples like uh, Applied Materials moving their R&D facility to Shanghai. That sort of follows the silicon industry. That's where their customer base is. They're there to service the wafer silicon industry. So it's a very important notion to keep in mind. How do we keep solar cells and uh, solar panel manufacturing here in the US? And then if we look more closely at uh, where is the US in terms of, uh, in terms of this industry, maybe uh, exports, imports is a good way to characterize it. We're actually a net exporter. So if you include all of the products we just discussed, we're actually a net exporter. You can see, as I mentioned, we have a, a lion's share of polysilicon up here that's really supporting the whole thing. But when it comes to the cells and the modules, we tend to uh, not make so much. And we actually import quite a bit from what appears to be some low-cost labor regions and some other countries. But the nature of these trade flows, what drives these imbalances, is what we're here to discuss. Best of times and the worst of times. Here is a hockey stick that every startup likes to see, the growth curve uh, for PV in recent years. But it's accompanied by this falling market share for the US and a rising market share for China. 
So I'm going to talk about China and Taiwan quite a bit today, but many other countries, including Malaysia and Singapore, have also increased their manufacturing uh, market share significantly over the last couple of years. Uh, but for simplicity, we're going to talk mostly today about China. So what is it that drives this growth for China? And why has the US market share ceded to that region? China is largely an export industry. So they, it's not that they, they utilize a lot of these modules domestically. They're making the modules and shipping most of them to Europe. And it's changed a little bit in recent years. They're beginning to diversify. In the beginning of 2011, there were some uh, exchange rate changes that really hurt some of the manufacturers there with customer base in Europe. So the RMB to Euro was not favorable, and a lot of the profits were hurt. Spain curtailed a lot of their deployment of PV. The Italian market has dropped off significantly. The German market continues to have some uncertainty around it. So the Chinese manufacturers have recognized the importance of diversifying. And a lot of the growth in China has actually been among four big players. So we have Trina Yingli, JA Solar, and SunTech, whom you'll hear from uh, next week. They've gone from basically zero to two gigawatts apiece in about five years, which is pretty significant if you consider that the entire silicon industry in the US is around 500 megawatts. Each one of these companies is two to four times the size of manufacturing in the US. Um, so what has enabled that? And there's a lot of speculation about uh, no cost or low cost debt that's fueled this growth. And undoubtedly, this, is much, this growth rate has been much faster than would be able to be sustained if they had to go to outside uh, private capital sources. So that's certainly a part of it. Um, technology diffusion can't be underscored uh, enough. So their ability to buy turnkey lines from German equipment suppliers, for example, has really enabled these companies to uh, develop very rapidly. And in fact, the silicon technology that they all uh, employ is the most mature of the PV technologies. And you can see the portfolio of PV technologies made in China and Taiwan versus the US. So while they have a much larger market, their thin film market is actually about a tenth the size of the US manufacturing base. So when we talk about the China PV industry, we're really talking about wafer-based silicon PV manufacturing. So it's one technology. And that's critical for the discussion here today. Um, what drives the difference in technology market share from one country to another? In the US, we tend to use a lot of private capital sources to fund both R&D and manufacturing. And so having a story that you are a dif differentiated technology with a differentiated cost position, for example, is very important to getting funding. It's easier to tell that story, as we'll talk about here in a moment, with uh, thin film technology than it is to differentiate yourself as a silicon player. It's very difficult to uh, say that your wafer-based silicon technology is, is significantly different than others on the market. <coughs> Bloomberg New Energy Finance has uh, collected data on both the VC and private equity investment in solar around the world, as well as debt financing. There's some questions about what data goes into these charts, but you can use this as one measure to say that in the US, we're very good at funding early stage technologies and pretty poor on the follow through to manufacturing. So once again, we're rewarding differentiated technologies. So the startups that spin out of our great institutions like Stanford, for example, um, but we're not so good at turning those into products. Um, the private capital strategy, when private capital is dried up in 2008 or 2009 with the recession, the availability of this capital dried up significantly. The uh, US government stepped in in the forms of some of the loan guarantee programs to try to, uh, to fill in the gap, so to speak, with, uh, with programs like 1703 and 1705. But even words from those programs say that they want to reward innovative technologies. So the focus here in the US has been 
innovative technologies, something that could possibly displace existing technologies, something that has high risk but high reward. Whereas in China, I would say that a lot of the scale up had to do with job creation, creating jobs that have good paying, good high wages to keep up with the pace of inflation in that country. This is a obligatory NREL chart that we must have in every one of our PowerPoints. Um, there actually is a point here though. So when we talk about technology differentiation, um, the two blue lines are silicon. This is multi-crystalline, this is monocrystalline, the wafer-based uh, technologies. They've sort of leveled off a bit, but they're fairly high. Um, here you see a lot of, there's a couple of things to observe. First of all, most of these institutions are Western, so there's a lot of uh, uh, Sandias, there's a couple Stanfords on here, um, some NRELs, um, many European uh, company or institutions as well. Uh, not a lot of Chinese companies, and that's an important point that we'll uh, emphasize here in a moment. But the other thing to uh, consider is that if you're a wafer silicon technology, you're probably manufacturing a module that's about 15%, maybe your cells are 18%. Sun power cells, maybe are 24%, modules around 20, 21%. If you're a SIGS company, you've demonstrated in the laboratory a 20% efficiency, but you're producing only 10 to 12%, perhaps, or if that. So there's a lot of headroom between what's been demonstrated in the laboratory and what's being done in the manufacturing line. <laughs> And that's a significant story that a lot of thin film companies tell to differentiate themselves to gain access to private capital. If their, their uh, technology uh, is capable of closing that gap with silicon, then they will have a disruptive cost position. So they're already, many of the thin film technologies are already very low cost dollars per watt. So if you consider the uh, first solar numbers, which are often discussed, maybe they're 76, 77 cents a watt. They're at about 11.5%, 11.6% efficiency. They hope to get to maybe 15% efficiency in the next five years. They're already low cost. If they improve their performance, that's significant. Silicon, on the other hand, Trina's talking about costs of about a buck or less by the end of the year, maybe less than a dollar. Sun Power is talking about achieving a dollar by 2015 with efficiencies of about 20%. So you can see that there's a big opportunity for thin films to displace silicon if they're able to close the efficiency gap. So this is another reason why thin films are uh, a significant opportunity for investment in uh, private markets like the US. So how is our innovative, our focus on innovative technologies, uh, has it been successful? And there are, uh, Quite a few headlines in the popular press these days to su suggest that no, in fact, it has not been successful, that China is uh, a dominant force in PV today, that uh, China has won the solar war, now what? Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with some of these company names. Solyndra has been in the news a <laughs> couple of times. I've received an email about once an hour for the last three weeks. I know nothing about that technology at all. Um, Evergreen, there was uh, SpectraWatt, it was another silicon firm. There are other headlines that suggest that this is actually not as bad as it appears. And you see a variety of firms from startups to established solar companies like First Solar to established global firms like GE making significant investments in manufacturing plants in the U.S. GE certainly doesn't invest in the US because they want to invest in the US just to say they're American. They're a very global company. So what is the rationale behind some of these moves? <clears throat> First, we'll get into some of the macroeconomics, some of the backdrop behind our analysis. And I don't know if anyone watched 60 Minutes last night. I did, I had my three-year-old was climbing all over me. I was trying to listen to it, but I felt very vindicated. I was li listening to the CEO answer questions about why he was bringing manufacturing back to the US. This is a very Republican guy, the leader of a global uh, company who makes no apologies for trying to increase shareholder value. And one of the first things he cited was differences in wage rate inflation. 
So if anyone's followed what's been occurring in China, actually the standard of living has gone up significantly as they've become uh, the world's factory. I've taken uh, one shot at uh, trying to estimate the expected inflation in China. It's admittedly a conservative one. In, uh, in some sectors, wage rates have increased by 50% or more. Um, in the US, that's certainly not the case. I have not received a 50% raise in a while. <laughs> this has significant implications, though. If you look at building a factory that has a depreciable life of maybe five to seven years, 50% uh, wage rate inflation would be significant. I have assumed a 6.5% wage uh, inflation uh, for China, about 3.6% for the US. And just to uh, underscore this uh, important uh, element, uh, these are wage rates as reported by the National Bureau of Statistics in China, going up to about 2009 with a 2010 estimate. It varies significantly just as it does in the US. Um, I will also mention that at least one large solar manufacturer who will, rename nameless, who will remain nameless, but I think is coming here next week, uh, <laughs> mentioned that wages at their factories had increased by about 50% last year alone. That's pretty significant. And then if I were a global firm like GE and I were looking at building a factory, China doesn't have the lowest wage rates in the world. There are other places that have even lower wage rates. So if wages were the entire uh, challenge, then I would go someplace else. But there's some volatility in some of those locations. Um, and here I'm measuring the country beta for the US and for China versus the all country, all world index, um, just to get a sort of a feel for how volatile the Chinese market is when it's growing at 10% per year. As it turns out, it's, it's a bit more volatile. How, it, as, a, uh, as a cost analyst, trying to take into account some of these considerations can be uh, quite difficult. How do we quantify the uh, cost of IP security risk or of uh, economic and uh, familiarity with, with business and legal environments or economic and political stability. It turns out it's very difficult, at least for me, to, uh, to do it, especially if uh, I have limited access to large databases, not what I do on a regular basis. There are a lot of different models to try to accomplish this. Uh, we've chosen to use the global CAPM method simply uh, because the data was accessible for us. We think it gives us at least one way of, uh, of looking at this problem. So we look at the weighted average cost of capital. And for debt financing, we will get into what our assumptions are. But we look at the impact of inflation and leverage, principally, on the cost of debt. For the cost of equity, if I'm going to go to raise money from the equity markets, it's a global capital market. right? So investors have the opportunity to invest in my firm in China or in another firm in the US or Globally, you can make investments pretty quickly these days. So I, we have tried to take into account both the country risk premium as well as the equity market risk premium. Um, this is open for debate how we went about doing this. But uh, at the very least, it at least it takes into account the, the various uh, factors that we want to include, such as inflation and uh, market volatility. So a big part of the analysis has been what types of subsidies and incentives do the companies get in China versus the US. And uh, this has been largely anecdotal data that small companies have uh, shared with us when they are investigating uh, locating a factory here versus Singapore, Malaysia, China. Um, what kind of debt rates are they being offered? What kind of tax holidays? What types of other direct grants have they been offered to build a factory in different locations? The things to point out, I think, are the need for domestic ownership. So in China, some of these firms have told us that in order to gain access to the low cost debt to build a factory, they must be a minority stakeholder in that venture. In other words, you're basically selling your technology. 
Um, other significant factors are the interest rates on the debt. So here we're looking at uh, three to four and a half percent, and I'll distinguish the two in the case studies in a moment. And the tax holiday is obviously notable. So the 20-year uh, tax holiday in China versus the five to seven year tax holiday in, offered by some states here in the US, or the 30% MTC, which we consider as a, in this analysis as a cash grant. So I'm gonna walk through two case studies. I have one about uh, silicon technology and another about a thin film technology. And uh, the differences between these are essentially in the levels of automation from region to region. So you can highly automate uh, some aspects of the silicon manufacturing. And there's essentially no difference in automation for the thin film technology that we're looking at. Uh, another one is that uh, you have intermediate products for silicon that can be shipped very low cost that are not made on glass, things like wafers and cells. And for thin films, you are depositing them on glass, so you can't avoid shipping glass. All right, first hypothetical case study here. So I want to walk you through an analysis to depict what is the advantage of an established Chinese silicon PV manufacturer considering a US end market or customer. This is sort of the case for foreign direct investment. <clears throat> It's important, I guess, I skipped a slide. This is the one I wanted earlier, so I'll just go to this one first. So when we look at the uh, manufacturing cost differences between the US and China, um, I think the speaker next week will talk a lot about how they've stripped cost out of manufacturing their technologies, and it's not, all, it's not all about labor. And I would agree, it's not all about labor. If you look at building a 60 megawatt facility in the US, versus a 60 megawatt facility in China. And the differences here are in labor rates, although you can't see it here because we're adding a lot of automation to the US case um, and stripping out automation in the case of China. So you strip out your robots, you add a lot more cheap laborers. The differences are all, almost a wash. It's about a three to 4% difference between a highly automated US cell line and a low automated Chinese cell line. But when you go to significant scale, so say a two gigawatt factory, you first get some economies of scale benefits just for having a large factory, but there are diminishing returns beyond about 250 megawatts. You next get a benefit from having a more well-developed supply chain to support those factories. So in China, you now have Chinese companies that supply the equipment, companies like Seven Star, that only supply equipment to Chinese factories. The equipment, in some cases, I think a Chakralski puller from uh, a Chinese company is, in some cases, 10% uh, the cost of a Chakralski puller from a European company. Um, in the case of wet benches, we've seen equipment there that's 30% uh, the cost of equipment in the West. What we have assumed is a 50% discount on wet benches, screen printers, co-firing furnaces only. So a few of the operations get a significant discount. And then you get a purchase, uh, a volumetric purchase break of about 10% on all of the materials that you buy. And considering we're comparing a 60 megawatt versus a 2000 megawatt factory, I'd say a 10% discount on materials is probably fairly conservative. That ends up being about an 18 to 20% core cost advantage. Before you account for the investment risks that we just talked about or inflation, or shipping costs, the core cost advantage is about 20%. Shipping costs are, however, significant for the glass modules. So if you're the silicon PV module manufacturer in China, you can ship your cells to the US at relatively little cost, very low cost, less than a penny in some cases. But shipping glass is expensive. Now, not including breakage of the glass or transit time and the cost of capital. If we just look at filling up a container with a dense material like glass, the shipping costs are a small piece of this pie. The rest is logistics and handling fees once you get to the port. So what we're considering in this case study is actually shipping from Shanghai to LA by boat and then by truck from LA to Mesquite, Arizona, which is the site of SunTech's 300 megawatt solar farm their customer, versus 
making all of the modules, making the cells in China, but making all of the modules in Goodyear, Arizona, 20 miles away from the customer. And this is based on the packing density per container from their data, from SunTech's data sheets. So it's about a five cent cost benefit for manufacturing the module in the US. So if you look at the core cost advantage of making the cells in China and making the modules in the US versus making cells and modules in China and shipping them all, we see that the China direct cost advantage is about one to two percent, but the cost advantage including shipping is actually offset. There's a five percent cost disadvantage for China. And so the other things that we haven't considered at this point are the cost of inflation, of the tax holidays, and of the direct subsidies. So we've set up a couple of cases here. Some of them are very hypothetical and do not exist, but um, let's go through them. We have the US unsubsidized case, a US loan guarantee case, a US loan guarantee with a 30% MTC, that's the manufacturing tax credit, issued as a, a cash grant in year one. And then state subsidies, as has been offered to some PV module manufacturers in the US, versus unsubsidized China and China subsidized. A couple of these are truly uh, of the land of leprechauns and uh, unicorns. The Chinese unsubsidized case really does not exist. And the loan guarantee plus MTC really does not exist. Uh, but we put them up there anyway. Um, so if you were to look at how, ch how SunTech finances its operations, you can uh, publicly find that their book, va book value of debt to book value of assets is about 60%. So we've assumed the same leverage across the board. This is, again, the case for foreign direct investment. This is saying, should the company build a module plant here in the US? And then if you look at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, you find that most of their debt financing since 2008 has been about 4.5%. And we think that's a significant subsidy um, based on the amount of leverage that they have, but also the, uh, the cost, the risk-free rate in China. And so we have a risk-free rate in China. The five-year bond is actually at about 4.6%. Uh, so they're getting uh, debt for building factories that's at about their five-year government bond rate, which is pretty nice, especially if you're in the solar industry, which has a few risks associated with it. Um, then we take into account the expected inflation, so we get a nominal cost of debt. Then we look at the expected market return for the China broad market index. Um, and I think it was about 20 years of data, arithmetic average. We also look at, as I said before, the risk of the country, the volatility of the country, and the nominal equity market risk premium, which here appears actually lower than the US, but it's offset in our formula by the uh, country risk premium. What ends up happening is we get a cost of equity that's about 30% higher than the cost of equity in the US. So we're basically saying an equity investor in this company would require a 30% higher return than investing in a company in the US because of the perceived risks associated with investing in that country. Um, if we take into account the tax rate, uh, the effective tax rate, so not statutory, but effective, and we have a citation for this, but uh, so I believe it's Merkel. They uh, sampled about 7,000 companies in the US and found that the effective tax rate is about 28% in the US and about 21% in China. Of course, we have the tax holiday for the Chinese case. So we get to a cost of capital of about 20%. And for the US, we did a similar unsubsidized case. And the risk-free rate for five year, the five-year uh, US Treasury bill is about 0.88% or some ridiculously low number these days. Um, so if you account for the leverage in the firm, we get to about 6.4% based on our uh, estimate. And taking into account inflation, we get to about cost of about 10% for the debt. It all gets us to about a cost of capital of about 15%. So at the end of the day, the cost of capital for the Chinese company is about 30% higher than for a US company um, based on the cost of debt and the risk of the equity. 
So what this allows us to do is to uh, run sort of just a discounted cash flow and to look at what is the minimum return that this company would need to hit that hurdle rate. And for China, this unsubsidized case, which does not exist, you can see the price is the highest at about $1.32 per watt for this particular product. The subsidies lower that by about four cents, but the US case is actually lower still. So what this is saying is if there were significant enough demand in the US for them to build a factory, say a couple 300 megawatt farms, maybe just one 300 megawatt farm, we'll get to that in a minute, but if they had significant enough demand here in the US, there is, there is enough evidence or enough analysis to show here that uh, they should build their factory in the US rather than ship their modules from China. I don't think they're going to get subsidies at any point, but the, I guess the nice conclusion is that subsidies are not needed for glass module, silicon module manufacturing to be competitive with Chinese module manufacturing, assuming the same cost for cell manufacturing. So this is just the module step in the supply chain. So in this case, we're basically saying that Chinese companies, if there is sufficient demand, should build factories close to their customers in the US. The second um, case study that we'll take you through is very different. It's a thin film technology. So this is sort of the innovative startup. They're not an established player. It's all deposited on glass. They can't just ship cells. They have to ship glass. So in that case, they can't avoid any part of these shipping costs by shipping cells. They're shipping five cents. Their shipping cost is about five cents. Um, very similar type of uh, assumptions went into this. This is Shanghai to LA, ground shipping down to uh, Mesquite, Arizona, or Goodyear, Arizona over to Mesquite. So you can build your factory next to your customer, or you can ship it from Shanghai. So the SIGS module that we're looking at is actually near term, maybe five, six years down the road. It's a 16.5% module. It's um, made on glass, monolithically. Uh, and in this case, it's frameless. So we get to a total CapEx of about 40 cents for the factory. You actually get a benefit in terms of CapEx for the Chinese case. Because the facilities are free, we're assuming that through the economic development zones in China that they get free factories. There's no difference in automation between these two or in labor intensity. So for the first, this is based on the first solar case, where first solar does a copy smart uh, manufacturing facility kind of design where each factory, Vietnam, Arizona, Germany, it's all the same factory, same level of automation. So if they turn a dial in Ohio, they can turn the same dial in Vietnam. In this case, there is a significant core cost advantage for the Chinese, which is offset by the shipping costs that are unavoidable. They cannot just ship cells. They have to ship modules. So they have a big 10% cost benefit, but shipping outstrips most of it in coming to uh, the US. And once again, in looking at factors like inflation and market volatility, we find that the US is a better place to invest. It's more stable, has a lower cost of uh, lower cost of debt, for example. Um, we're looking at the same case studies, US, the loan guarantee, manufacturing tax credit, state subsidies, versus China and the Chinese subsidies. We have changed some numbers here. In this case, the startup is, uh, the leverage is based on um, a sampling of S&P 500 companies, non-financial institutions. Typical leverage is about 65%. In China, the typical leverage is about 50%, and that, makes some sense. Uh, there, is some, um, there are some that believe that more government ownership results in lower, lower leverage or has some impact on capital structure. We assume that the Chinese subsidies case, the company will take advantage of as much leverage as, as China will offer. So in this case, they're allowing them to take up to 80% leverage at a very, very low rate, 3% which is nice, but the high cost, the high leverage actually results in a high cost of equity for the firm. So what this is basically saying is if you max out the credit card the first time in building factory number one, it's gonna be really hard to go to the private capital markets to build factory number two unless you paid off the uh, Chinese bank. So we're basically saying that uh, the cost of equity goes through the roof when you go up, up to your eyeballs in debt. 
Um, we also have the same kind of assumptions about uh, taxes for the various, uh, various cases. And once again, you get about a 30% cost of capital premium for the subsidized China case over the US case. So when we look at what is the minimum sustainable price for each of these, for the manufacturers in each of these cases, once again, the unsubsidized China case, which does not exist, would be very high. With subsidies, they're very competitive. Uh, the capitalized value of this subsidy, it's a $200 million factory. And the, this is like cutting a check to this company for $96 million in year one, if you were to capitalize all those benefits, including tax holidays. The U, that puts them in line with a US case scenario. Um, going to a loan guarantee or a state subsidy is is like cutting that company a check for about $25 million in year one. So you can see the scale of the subsidies required to make China competitive with the rest of the world is about three to four times X what the US offers. <clears throat> so in summary, I guess the, uh, the key takeaways that I, I have from this analysis. So China is a world leader in uh, global production they make a lot of our PV products, but they don't currently have a domestic market, and that is changing. They have a, a fit that's being proposed and being considered. That could change things significantly. Uh, the US is a leader in early stage technology, so we do a great job at creating startups and have some great ideas that come out of our institutions, don't capitalize on them all the time. Shipping costs outweigh a lot of the benefits of going to a low cost labor location so if we have more consistent or stronger demand here in the US, I think you would see more manufacturing here. Access to low cost capital is really critical, especially for the, start, the case of the startup, um, especially in the case of the last three to four years. So we touched a bit on some of the investment risks in China, but one that probably is worth stating again is the IP protection. Uh, issues. So some firms have at least expressed some uh, s reservations in going to China because they're a thin film company, they have an innovative disruptive technology, and their perception is that if they go to a country like China or even to Taiwan, that the technology will diffuse pretty quickly. Uh, people, workers change jobs. Uh, it, it, somehow the cat will get out of the bag. They want to establish a market presence first. Um, but that can be offset if there is no capital available here. So the case that we just showed of the US unsubsidized really is another one that has not existed in the last three to four years. For a lot of these thin film companies, it was either loan guarantee and state subsidies or go to China. There was really no US private market, uh, private entity to go to to build a factory. Some conclusions that uh, I would leave you with and open up for discussion. Um, the China advantage may not be sustainable. We saw that 99% of their uh, products are wafer-based silicon. So if someone can truly come up with a disruptive technology to displace that technology, uh, that's a significant risk to them, as are foreign exchange rates. So when the euro plummets, so do the profits of the Chinese companies. They're also currently, at least, very dependent on uh, exports. They don't have a domestic market, but that could change. The US incentives can level the playing field significantly. So the access to capital that I just mentioned for the startup through the loan guarantee and state subsidy cases is uh, really important for a lot of these companies. So in order to go from laboratory to manufacturing facility, uh, there needs to be a significant amount of capital. And right now the capital markets are still a little tight. And so for uh, discussion purposes, I throw up um, some ideas. If we're going to talk about the future of the US PV industry, um, perhaps we should consider technologies that leverage our strengths. And there are a number of products that exemplify that, such as the polysilicon feedstock. As I mentioned, we have low cost hydropower, which gives us an advantage in producing polysilicon today. There are complementary industries to consider. So the non-wovens, uh, specialty chemicals, uh, 3M and DuPont still make a lot of roll-to-roll -roll products here. Perhaps there's a way to leverage that kind of processing for PV. 
Um, we still have a lot of great institutions here that are coming up with uh, innovative ideas every day. And if we can find a way to uh, capitalize on those, we will be in a better position in the future. Some of the risk factors include material resource availability. There's uncertainty with the loan guarantee program these days and inflation or hyperinflation that often follows um, a recession that has a financial component to it are all risk factors that should also be, be considered. So thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Yes. Production. So the amount of capital required to build, uh, let's say, a megawatt or two megawatts of modules on a dollars per watt basis, it's no different. In fact, it's probably higher than for a very large plant. So you get some economies of scale. They tap out pretty quick. For thin film companies, you hit an economy of scale at maybe 200 megawatts. But uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like there's a reverse economy of scale. We're building these little flex lines. But I could be proven wrong. The current technologies don't, don't seem to suggest that. Yes, right here. Go ahead. The guy in the back, I think, got the question up first. What, what role uh, do the stricter environmental standards in the U.S. So it's more significant at different steps in the supply chain. I think we've seen some, uh, there was some horror stories or case studies about polysilicon manufacturing, for example, in China. A lot of that industry is cleaned up. They're clamping down on a lot of manufacturers there because they have overcapacity, largely. So they've really tightened up the environmental standards. It usually takes some type of uh, catastrophe to make that happen. There was recently another one with, uh, I don't want to say the company's name because I, I can't remember it completely, so I'll probably misquote it and say some other company. Um, the wafer manufacturing tends to be a dirty process as well, where you can gain some cost or competitive edge because you have relaxed environmental standards. But in terms of cells and modules, there's not a significant one to be had. It's a pretty standard process. Uh, there's not a lot of room for you to cut corners environmentally and save costs. Are there strings attached to receiving the, the Chinese um, state subsidies around where you can be employing people? Like, I understand so the goal is certainly employment, right? Um, the biggest string that we saw attached, the giant rope that we saw attached, was uh, property ownership. So there's, if you're an innovative company, for example, if you're a US-based company, I want to say innovative, but if you're a US-based company and you want to build a factory, uh, in order to gain access to the Chinese debt, you have to be a minority shareholder. That seems like a pretty big string attached to that. Um, certainly, in the case of hiring and firing and even of wage rates, I think there's government controls on those prices, price of labor. So laying people off is not necessarily an option either. Just a, a quick follow-up there. Is it, um, the, the economics alone, you make a compelling argument that it would make sense for Chinese manufacturers to build mod, uh, module plants here. Mm -hmm. My question is if that would be supportive uh, because you'd be employing U.S. employees as opposed to the... Yeah, I, I, uh, I recommend you uh, ask that question next week as well. So uh, a big part of the analysis next week, I'm sure, that uh, he will talk about is there's very little labor in their manufacturing process now. Uh, they've stripped it down to look like a Western line. And the reason for that is because of the wage rate inflation. And so if you do the quick math, a 20 to 50% wage rate inflation, um, we calculate the crossover point where you'll need robots is about 3.2x the current Chinese wages. So you'll hit the need for automation before you depreciate your five-year depreciate before your five-year depreciation. So they're already investing in automation very heavily there. Uh, so when they present that argument, the question is, well, then why are you still shipping glass? It seems like you could save more cost by making it in the U.S. But uh, I, I believe that there are some strong ties. There, government control in the boardroom uh, directing some part of that strategy or influencing it. To build off that question, you said if there was sufficient local demand in the US, it would pay off to locate the manufacturing here. Did you do any um, analysis to understand where that tipping point was? 
So uh, a typical production line is going to be at least 60 megawatts. That's a single cell line, but you'd probably have multiples of those. So it's probably going to be 100, 200 megawatts at the very least. If you look at this first solar example in the headlines that I showed earlier, where first solar, they have production in Germany, Vietnam, they had considered China, of course Malaysia. They're building a factory in Arizona. Now granted, they got some pretty good subsidies to outfit an existing factory there, but it's really no different than existing factories and economic development zones in China. So why did they build in China as opposed to, or in uh, Arizona as opposed to China? It's because they have a 300 megawatt project just down the street. So it seems to suggest that somewhere on the order of 200, 300 megawatts is plenty of reason to build here. Um, and SunTech, for example, they have their Goodyear Arizona facility manufacturing modules. It's a fairly small facility. Right down the street, 19 miles away, they have a 300 megawatt project. So instead of shipping modules 19 miles, they're shipping them from Shanghai or, or from China. Uh, so it seems to suggest there's other reasons why they are not building the factory here. Yes? So you said that and innovative technologies which could provide paradigm shift could upstage uh, Chinese uh, coastline silicon technology. However, to do that, you need sometimes new kind of equipment which needs to be developed, which is not supplied by applied materials or novellas and those kind of companies. So how would, uh, can you comment on that? That scenario. New equipment for innovative, well, a lot of the uh, startups tend to have to invent their own equipment for key processes, which is uh, so that needs also funding. part of their IP, right? That needs funding. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a disruptive case, hopefully you can tell a compelling story to get that private funding. But I'm also I, I'm trying to uh, underscore the fact that programs like loan guarantee and the state incentives, which is basically lending at state bond rates, is really critical, a critical complement to the innovation that goes on here in the US. So we need more programs like this to invest in these high risk but high reward technologies. That's a really critical uh, fact that affected that pie chart I showed earlier. Um, uh, is this a question? So we said that US retains a lot of advantage when we add the shipping cost. So is that true? Is it true that all the cells manufactured in China would get shipped to the US? No. Or if a fraction gets shipped to the Europe? Absolutely. In the silicon case, what we're showing is basically keep your silicon cell line centralized. Keep it at two gigawatts. You can keep it in China. You can ship those products all over the world, very low cost and have module production lines sent, situated regionally near where your customers are so you avoid shipping the glass. So the cell has no glass. And then you ship it to the location, laminate it with glass, and finish your module. But it's the final step in the process that we're advocating would be regionalized for silicon. With thin films, you can't do that because the cells are deposited on the glass. So there's no way to have separate facilities in this monolithic case. How do the margins compare in cell manufacturing versus module assembly? And uh, as a follow-up to that, what is the possibility that these cell manufacturers would centralize their cell production and then use contract manufacturers for the module assembly? Yeah, you're actually seeing some of the latter. Sun Power is doing some of the latter. Um, so uh, certainly a lot of the technology, at least for Sun Power, is in the cell, right? So that's the part that they want to control. And the module side is less important. And I have to be careful how I say that because it's critically important to the reliability of the device. If you're considering a vertically integrated company like we're looking at here, a Chinese company that does cells and modules, basically they would have the same profit margin. So you'd have a transfer price from your sister company to your other sister company. It would be the same transfer price, same margin as your module margin. So I don't know if that helped the answer though. Germany is the largest market right now. Did you see something similar happen in Germany where manufacturing happened to move to Germany because it was a big market? Yeah, well, we're actually, we saw that and now we're seeing uh, some of the German manufacturers uh, sort of go away, but it's hard to uh, separate out from those trends what is company specific and what is 
emblematic of uh, that industry or that market. Um, we haven't done enough analysis to have a have a position on that yet. It's a good one to look at, though. Europe. My colleague Ted James, who I must I must acknowledge, other people who uh, contributed to this somewhere. I think I have acknowledgments in there. Well, maybe I don't. I guess I don't have to acknowledge them that badly. <laughs> um, but Ted James was a, a, a another author of this analysis. He's nodding. Yes, there are Chinese companies there. I think module assembly. The heavier class components. There's some regionalization of the module manufacturing. Okay. I'm not an expert on the German market, so I apologize. Any other questions? Yes? What, what incentives were these closer offered to uh, General Electric to have them start up? I don't even think they've, have they publicly announced where they're going to build their factory yet? I don't think they have. But they're certainly uh, weighing different states, uh, maybe making proposals to different states. What we have typically seen from states who have made offers to PV companies, not GE specifically, it's been a combination of access to capital, that's the biggest one for these companies, low cost capital is typically at a state bond rate, the speed of the capital. So loan guarantee can take, in some cases, the way we've, the way we've uh, analyzed it, two years, has a lot of due diligence associated with it, so maybe a couple million dollars in consulting fees. Um, States tend to get the money out the door, in the cases we've looked at, much faster. And then they also do some direct grants in the form of training and facilities. So it would probably be some combination of that. Uh, they find you a vacant manufacturing facility and outfit it with new utilities for you. Why have the Chinese allowed their labor rates to go up so much? It's, there's a question for a macroeconomist in the group, but I, you know, it's, there's so much money flowing into China, you can't help but let the wage rates go up some amount. Um, inflation is occurring. Uh, they're the world's factory. Certain segments of the population are becoming pretty, pro pretty po prosperous. So uh, I think the question for me is really why haven't the wage rates gone up faster? Um, but that, that would be a question for an economist in the group. But. Last week, I think, was um, don't waste any time on anything below 20%. The balance of system costs are so high that it's yeah. nonsensical to do to really mess with anything below 20 or 25%. Um, so you were, you were focusing on a different question, but if if we focus on that question too, so. Um, what we really look at is the manufacturing costs of different technologies. We try to help the researchers understand what the cost drivers are so they can focus on the right things. And what we have found is that chasing efficiency um, is really important. And if you look at the different market segments, the value of efficiency varies. So for ground mount systems, in some sense, you can scale the size of the farm to get different megawatts of output, right? If you have a lower efficiency module, you're going to need more acres. There's a cost associated with that, but you can at least scale it. If you have a house that has 35 square meters of rooftop space that's suitable, facing south and not covered by a chimney and a tree, you can't really scale that unless you go ground mount. Maybe your wife doesn't want you to clear cut the uh, yard. So you're somewhat constrained. So uh, we actually, the way we've modeled it, we find, and it's not linear, but a good rule of thumb is at 15% efficiency, the value of each additional point is like reducing your module price by about 15 cents. So if I go from 15% 15, 15 to 16%, I've cut my system cost by 15 cents. For utility, if I go from 15% to 16%, I've cut my cost by about 8 cents. So I don't know if, going, if, 20, if anything below 20% is nonsensical, but uh, SunPower believes that they're... Um, in 2015, I think their roadmap says they, they want to be at a buck, a manufacturing cost of a dollar, and uh, efficiency of 20%. So right away, if you're a 10% module, you've just given yourself an 80 cents uh, penalty, so you better be manufacturing your products for 20 cents. And that can be pretty hard, considering the cost of just glass. So as these things come down in cost and efficiency rises, it's going to squeeze some of these lower efficiency technologies. but. I don't know if the uh, bar has been set yet, and 20% seems kind of high. 
Yes. Um, you mentioned how uh, the U.S. is very good at funding things in the early stages, and China is better about following through. Um, for the U.S., how do you think that can be changed? That attitude can be changed, and who do you think is in a position to sort to start changing? That? It's the way a, it's the way a private capital market works. You know, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it needs to be fixed. Um, so there's a there's another economy here that we're discussing that's. You know, it's an it's an industrial policy question, and what's the role of government? But uh, I also mentioned that there's a lot of risk with what China is doing because they've bet the farm on silicon, wafer-based silicon. They're going to bear the cost of that risk. So if somebody displaces silicon, all of a sudden they have hundreds of billions of dollars investment in making buggy whips, so to speak. So I think the private capital markets they tend to uh, work. Pretty well. I don't think they need to be fixed necessarily, but certainly access to capital for the young startups is uh, really critical. So if we can find some way to uh, help subsidize some of the risk for a technology that has the opportunity to help create an industry, you know, it's up to I guess uh, society to decide if the cost of that is worth it. But, yes. You mentioned the, the relative cost of energy being lower in the U.S., but you didn't really quantify that. And, and I know in particular in the earlier stages of the supply chain in polysilicon and casting and wafering, very energy intensive. Um, and presumably manufacturing glass and aluminum for modules is as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what, the, what that delta will look like perhaps going forward between China and the U.S.? Sure. So we modeled polysilicon production. Oops which is like the uh, blue part of this curve. We looked at direct chlorination process in China and hydrochlorination in the US. The US guys have been doing it for a lot longer and they know how to do it really efficiently. And maybe they, their energy intensity is like 70 kilowatts per kilogram or something like that. And in China, you now have new rules that is, for, is forcing out of business companies who make less than 3,000 metric tons per year or use more than I think it's like 200 kilowatts per kilogram or something. So first of all, their energy intensity can be much higher if you're not a, a, uh, an experienced player like a, a VACR or an MEMC. Or, um. Secondly, the cost of hydro for some of these firms, it's kind of a close guarded secret. I mean, we can look at the industrial rates and see in Washington, it's Washington State, maybe two to four cents or something. Tennessee Valley is getting a lot of business for polysilicon manufacturers these days. We've talked to some of these companies, and they're on the inner grid, as it's called, which is like everybody else loses power before you. You'll be the last one who gets your lights turned out when things go bad. So there's the reliability benefit. Um, but I think their cost, the way we've modeled it, I think is about four cents per kilowatt hour for some of these companies, and that may be too high. In China, it's a case of reliability as well as cost. LDK had mentioned in one of their annual reports a subsidized rate, and I forget what it is for the life of me, but I think it, it equated to about six and a half cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. So it gives you kind of a, an idea. It, we didn't model it as like two or three X. In the back. Uh, for those of us that are working on low efficiency devices, do you think that there's a lot of, do you think there's, um, motivation when you think about large surface area applications or perhaps consumer friendly applications that yeah. are like disposable or so uh, I was talking about uh, PV I was talking about utility farms when I was giving the benchmarks earlier um, and certainly there's going to be niche applications and if your product offers uh, capacity factor benefit in the way of temperature coefficient or low light uh, performance or low weight there are many buildings that are built with uh, without the need for snow loads. So uh, there's some opportunity there. Landfill covers, lots of consumer products. And the last thing I'll say is that you know early stage technologies shouldn't worry too much about my cost numbers in particular, because by the time you come to market, who knows where I'll be and my cost numbers won't be around. But uh, basic science shouldn't be worried too much about cost. So if you're working on an early stage, low efficiency technology, uh, I think you should be aware of what the targets are. but Certainly, we shouldn't uh, exclude technologies based on costs. In the back. Uh, I just want to know, like, what percentage of the you know, costing like 
I mean, you did costing, but I just want to know whether you included R and D in that. What's that? R and D. What percentage of? Uh, what percentage of the cost? So that was in our discounted cash flow, and we assumed the same number. I think uh, two and a half percent of revenues, I believe, went to R and D for these firms. Kind of a estimate, a bogey off some annual reports. There has been a study in the recent Energy uh, Policy Journal of Energy uh, Policy that showed that U.S. companies invest more in R and D as a percentage of revenues than. Other firms, particularly Chinese firms, so it can vary, but tends to be a couple percentage points of revenue as an overhead expense. Okay, well, uh, let's thank our For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.